drove to that place and got to go a little bit further forward. Welcome back to the COVID Chronicles here at Okonjima Nature Reserve, home of the Africat. And uh, joining me right now is Sarah Edwards. Hello. And um, warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah is the brown hyena researcher here at Okonjima Nature Reserve. Sarah, what are the aims and goals in regards to um, brown hyena research? Okay, so Okonjima is an enclosed nature reserve. So we're fully surrounded by an electric fence. So that means all our, of it. All of it, oh, yeah. Wow. So it means all the hyenas, leopards, and we speak giraffe. Of Twenty-two thousand hectares. Exactly, so? yeah. Oh. So these animals cannot move out, and new animals cannot move in. Okay. So whenever you fence in a wildlife population, you need to start managing that population because mm -hmm. emigration, immigration, the natural movements of animals are just cut off. So the goal of the brown hyena research is to try and understand their sort of altered ecology living in an enclosed reserve. Yeah. So we're looking at what is the population density? How many clans or family groups do we have? Yeah. What are their home range sizes? Yeah. Um, what happens when these young animals come to disperse? They mm -hmm. can't leave the reserve and there's a very high density of hyenas here. So they're all fighting and struggling for spaces mm -hmm. um, across the reserve. So. You know, that's, that's the aim. And then ultimately we want to come up with um, informed management decisions that we, that we can then, you know, apply not just on Okonjima, but across all enclosed reserves um, in Southern Africa, yeah. because this enclosed model is, is becoming very popular for conservation, yeah. especially in South Africa. There's a lot of enclosed reserves. All right, yeah. There we go. There we go. So there's, there's one of my hyenas. beautiful brown hyenas. Come to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah, um, speaking of them. Speaking of them, yeah. Uh, lovely. So you can see how the grass is so high at the moment. We're often just seeing the ear tips. Um, yeah. Yeah. They're very cur curious animals. They often approach like this. And especially Look at it, yeah. in an area where they've never faced human persecution, they yeah. are so relaxed and habituated with people. Um, it'd be interesting to see if it does have a collar or not. We have a number of collared hyenas. So it could be one of those research hyenas? It could be a research hyena. It's a bit hard to see in the long grass. Very beautiful, yeah. yeah. A lot of people think hyenas are ugly. You know, the Lion King has a lot to answer for, but <laughs> I think they're actually yeah, very beautiful. beautiful yeah. Especially the brown hyena with these beautiful manes. And when the light hits them like this, yeah. So it's out and about. Yeah, I mean, this is, we're in winter at the moment, so the hyenas, they start getting active earlier. Yeah. Um, so we often see them before sunset. So yeah, it's probably off trying to forage um, because they are scavengers. Yeah. They, they rarely hunt. Um, so, and that's another reason we think we've got so many brown hyenas here is because we have a high leopard density uh -huh. and we often see the hyenas um, stealing kills from the from leopards the or taking the scraps after they finish. So we think actually the leopards on Okonjima are beneficial for the brown hyenas and that's why we've got, we actually have the highest recorded density of brown hyenas anywhere in their distribution on Okonjima. So oh. it really is the place, if you want to come and see a brown hyena, uh -huh. this is an ideal place. Wow. Well, we're speaking about you. Yeah. Looking at us, We've also got the leopard box that we released the leopard out of, and I think there's some smell to that that he will also be interested in now. Yeah, he's probably thinking what what else could be there. You know, yeah. Getting another smell, not only. But you see, Sarah. he's got the nose up in the air. Yeah. Clearly focusing in on the smell from the box now. What's the population on Okonjima? So we've got about 48 individuals. 48, so it yeah. works out to a density of 
24 hyenas per 100 square kilometers. Um, this is absolutely number. sky high. Um, but with this, it does cause problems. You know, we, yeah. we do have a lot of competition. Um, we saw last year the, the first ever case of infanticide recorded for wild brown hyena. So we had two 10, 11 week old cubs and they were actually killed by another brown hyena. Wow. And we think this is a sort of population um, regulation. And yeah. um, they sort of self-regulate themselves now. These animals are known as too, potentially too many for the area and they start taking out the competition. Uh, eliminate yeah. your competitors. Yeah, which has not been recorded before in the wild. So yeah. um, we're learning a lot from the research that we do here. And there's a few giraffes as well, just observing what it's doing, yeah. maybe looking at us, but it definitely would not go for the giraffes. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're predominantly a, a scavenger. Um, yeah. At the sea, at the coast, um, brown hyenas, they hunt seal pups during the, the pupping season. Mm. So sort of, you know, over this Christmas New Year period, um, but typically brown hyenas are not good hunters. Yeah. Um, and this is another thing, another problem that they face in the, across their range is sort of conflict with, with humans. Mm -hmm. um, you know, farmers see them at, at a carcass if a cow has died and they see them eating and then they automatically think, okay, no, that hyena killed that cow. Yeah. So they often get shot, poisoned, snared. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's also why areas like Okanjima, these enclosed nature reserves are becoming more and more important for species like the brown hyena. Mm -hmm. Um, because they will end up as sort of the last stronghold for many species. Mm -hmm. So then it's even more important that we understand how to, to manage them properly. Yeah. You know, it, it might be that at one point we just have too many and we need to start taking these younger animals out and, and translocating to, them to other enclosed reserves, yeah. you know, to sort of mimic that natural dispersal mm -hmm. that they can't do for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's... Th a main focus also on the research at the moment is learning at what age do these hyenas start dispersing yeah. and, and what do they do? Um, do they manage to integrate into another clan on somewhere like Okanjima or do they become a what we call a nomadic individual where they don't have a fixed home range, they just wander vast distances yeah. or do they perhaps stay in their natal clan? So at the moment we are trying to collar uh, with GPS collars a lot of these sub-adults mm -hmm. that we know which clan they were born in yeah. and start looking at all these kind of things you know when they disperse what they do and um, if they're successful if they then become breeding mm -hmm. adults in another clan um, because inbreeding again is something that could happen here because yeah, you've got no no new genes coming in yeah. um, so another focus of ours is looking at um, taking genetic samples yeah. which i think we'll do later in the week with you guys um, to look at, you know, how related our different individuals are, because Okanjima's actually been enclosed now for 10 years plus. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of technical things that you have to think about when once you enclose a piece of land. We came across something really um, interesting, and uh, it's actually uh, the paste which they live on the grasses that we have come across. There is some right here, and uh, Sarah who just, or will just uh, tell us a little bit more. I understand, Sarah, that these um, animals actually do two pastes of two different colors. Yeah. Can you just um, inform us or elaborate on us a little bit about those pastes? Yeah, so brown hyenas are not like spotted hyenas. They don't use vocalizations to communicate. It's okay. all olfactory or scent communication. Yeah. So brown hyenas are the only member of the hyena family that's produced two different distinct pastes from their anal gland. So they leave paste marks like we're about to see now um, on grass stalks and in more desert environments it might be like thicker branches or even rocks, just any substrate where they can get this paste mark on. Yeah. And it's to communicate um, with other clans but also within the clan. Um, so because brown hyenas are, are scavengers, yeah. uh, but they always forage alone, that it's worth to communicate with the other clan members like, I've been here recently, I've foraged this area, 
sort of don't waste your time foraging here because I've emptied it. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's the black postmark that they produce, which is quite a short uh, lasting because that information must be current. Yeah. And then they produce a white postmark, which is a longer lasting, it's lipid based. And that's actually to communicate with other clans to say like this territory is occupied, um, you know, don't come here, we live here. So as part of my research, um, I'm actually taking samples of these place marks okay. to collect genetic um, material. All right. And this is going to be analysed so that we can start answering questions um, about this population. Um, what's the relatedness between different individuals? Um, you know, what's the genetic diversity of this population? Because obviously this has been fenced in um, for 10 years now so there is a risk of inbreeding yeah. so if we run the genetics we'll be able to sort of get a better idea of what's going on so i think we can take a sample okay. of this paste mark right. um i've got some tubes here Anything if we can, can help you with yeah maybe okay. if you can hold that mm -hmm. these tubes are full of something called rna later so it preserves the genetic material right. okay so what we don't want to do is take off the whole paste mark. You know, we just want to take a small part of it because we also don't want to, you know, start erasing that olfactory communication. So we yeah. just take a small part. So we just have a earbud. normal earbud <laughs> and we just give it a, just roll it on. Oops. Okay. And you can see that just yeah. a small bit. Yeah, really small, yeah. And then so that's enough to do the research. That is enough, yeah. And then we make sure this goes in the RNA later. So once we've got it in the RNA later, we just snip the end off and then attach the top. And it's always very important to label, okay. you know, make sure we know um, which area this paste mark has come from so we know which clan it's. Um, likely to have come off yeah. and as you can see this is bright bright white so this paste mark is extremely fresh it was probably the hyena that we've been following now yeah. who's just gone up the mountain behind us um, as as these paste marks gets older mm -hmm. the white actually turns like firstly to a yellow then a darker brown and then eventually quite a, a dark brown mm -hmm. so it's good to take samples when it's nice and fresh yeah. and then we just make sure that we label this nicely now well, what we will do now is we will leave this in the lab um, for a few hours at room okay. temperature. And then um, tonight we would put it in a deep freeze and then it can actually stay in a deep freeze for as long as we need. Okay. These samples will all be shipped to, to Germany. Uh -huh, um, they will be shipped to Germany. Yeah, that's where the analysis will be done. So not, um, here. not in Namibia, no. We've got a, a genetic specialist who's going to um, analyze this material for us. Okay. Sarah, with the information that you get from the research that you do about the brown hyenas um, is there any interest as well uh, from other either organizations or farmers to find out more or know more about this animal mm -hmm. uh, especially farmers uh, just to open up their minds and make them understand mm -hmm. that um, these are actually not the animals that go for for your cows mm -hmm. or goats um, do you share that with them? Yeah, so we, we have a number of sort of research outputs and way that we communicate with uh, different sectors um, of the community. So we, as much as possible, we're trying to publish our research in scientific journals so that the sort of scientific and academic community um, has access to those uh, findings. Um, we also do Africat newsletters that go out to many, many different people. Okay. Um, Africat is also part of the Large Carnivore Management Association of Namibia. Uh, we also share our results there. Um, and we often have, you know, different journalists or, or newspapers interested in our work. So we try and, you know, communicate that as, as far and as widely as we can um, to, to get these results out there. Because in the end, that's the whole point of research is to communicate your results and make sure other people are, are learning from it and, and applying what you've learned. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as much as possible, we're doing that. All right, Sarah, thank you for this uh, valuable information and for the work that you do. And thank you for the viewers. And we'll see you again on our next episode. And thanks to you guys for putting the spotlight on conservation. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm.